Hello and welcome to Light Maria. Today we're talking about the concept of genre, which at first might seem a really easy concept to understand. But actually, a genre world is a complicated world. Genres change and develop over time, they go through cycles of popularity, and theorists can't decide whether there really are genres, and if so, how many. So it's much more complicated than we might first think. At a very basic level, genre is about classifying text. It's about recognising the key conventions of a text and saying, yep, that's an action film, that's a Western, and so on. But in a postmodern society, we may not still use genre to classify our text. For example, we might choose our films um, because of the director that made it. We could um, choose them because of the studio, the part of the franchise that it's from, or if you're like me, you might choose your films because of the actors that are in there. Having said all of this, genres are undoubtedly still really important. You only have to scroll through a streaming website like Netflix or Now TV to see how texts are categorised in order to make it easier for people to choose. Genres are useful to all participants in what we might call the media magic triangle. So that's the triangle of audience, institution and text. For audiences, genre is a really essential tool. It helps us to understand and make sense of what we're seeing. So we'll see repeated recognisable elements on film posters, on TV advertisements, and know if that is something that we want to engage with. A genre text is a text that offers pleasure. It's something that we can recognise and spot elements within, but also be pleased when that genre moves away from our expectations. This links nicely to Steve Neal's famous quote about genres being um, instances of repetition and difference. Audiences love the repetition that they find in genre, they love spotting these elements, but at the same time, if it's not different enough, it won't stand out within that body of work. Neil also points out that repetition and difference doesn't just relate to audience. Differences happen because of contextual factors, so for example, changes in history, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, um, and also economic factors, such as um, if a genre becomes less popular and isn't doing so well at the box office, maybe it will be combined with something else in order to give it a boost. Now, the horror genre is a fantastic genre to um, use as an example here because it really reflects concerns and worries uh, that are happening throughout history. So, for example, during the 80s when there was an increase in the divorce rate, we see a lot more family horror, kind of murderous stepdads and things like that. Today, we might see more technology-based horror showing the kind of worry and concern over the surveillance culture and social media. So horror particularly has adapted over time to these kind of contextual factors. Economically, um, it's one of those genres where you can predict how popular it's going to be. So if a horror film has done really well in a particular franchise at this point, then the next one will probably do just as well. There's also certain times of year when we really want to watch horror, like Halloween. Horror also provides excellent examples of hybridity, the mixing of two or more different genres together to create something new. Genre hybridity also brings pleasure to audiences because we like to see how those genres are being combined. We might enjoy the humour, say, in a horror zombie film. Hybridity also brings greater economic security to a genre and might revitalise a genre that's losing popularity. This brings us on nicely to our institution aspect of our media triangle. Institutions find genres really helpful because they help them predict how many people will go and see a film or how many people will watch a TV drama. A genre product is less risky than something a bit more unknown. Genre will also influence um, scheduling. So for example, certain films will be released at certain times of the year. Certain TV dramas will be placed uh, at different times of the week. So for example, historical dramas are often shown on a Sunday evening. The genre of a product might also affect who stars in um, a film or a TV programme. For example, Jason Statham is likely to be cast in an action film, whereas Adam Sandler would usually be found in comedy. The genre can also be an essential marketing tool. And if we look across film posters and trailers and so on we can see perhaps a generic identity for particular films. That might come down to the star as I've already mentioned but it also might come down to the mise-en-scene, the colour, the setting etc and even the reviews and the promises of quality on the film poster can refer to the genre. 
The use of genre conventions by institutions isn't a new thing. During the golden age of Hollywood, the studio system, genre films were produced almost weekly. The institutions at that time were able to recycle props, recycle costumes, and really benefit from economies of scale by producing lots and lots of films all fitting within these specific genre categories. Despite all of these institutional factors, we still might find that the director has an influence on the film and the director may not want to work within a specific genre or be confined by a particular genre. So you'll find some directors who we might term as auteurs go beyond genre conventions. They may start off, say, in science fiction, but they may do other things that they are interested in to make that piece of work their own. Finally, we come to our last point on the media triangle of text. And genre elements really help us as media and film students to analyse texts in detail. Neil again gives us some things to think about here when we're looking at text. Firstly, he asks us to consider very similitude, how similar a film or TV programme is to the real world. And obviously some genres do this more than others, so documentaries, biopics, things like that, TV news and so on, are all representing um, the real world with a high degree of accuracy, whilst other genres such as science fiction are often based in fantasy and escapism. Another point to consider is narrative, and all the while we're looking for whether or not the narrative is similar to other films or television programmes within that genre. So we might think about narrative structure, we might think about themes and ideas that are put across, and we might think about the way in which the narrative is delivered. So for example, is there montage editing? Is there use of flashbacks to tell the story? Is there a voiceover? And does that link to specific genres that we know and love? Linked to this is characters, and we might question whether certain genres require certain character types. So, for example, in action films, we need the hero, but we also need the sidekick and also the love interest. Those characters might have a specific look or style to them that signifies the genre and allows us as the audience to make assumptions and for the filmmaker to take shortcuts in relaying what types of personalities they are. Our characters might have a specific narrative arc or journey that they need to go on also. And finally, in terms of text, Neil suggests that we look at the iconography. So we examine carefully the mise-en-scene of a piece and decide whether or not that fits with the genre expectations. We need to remember that certain choices will have been made in order to fulfil those genre functions and again, take those shortcuts that help relay meaning to the audience more easily. All genres would have specific iconography that we'd expect. So again, if we go back to our example of horror, we're more likely to see a large knife than, say, a double barrel shotgun as the murder weapon. There is so much more that you can say about genre theory, and we've really just touched the surface today. Neil is just one of the many theorists talking about this area. If you're interested in genre theory, I suggest you have a little look at An Introduction to Genre Theory by Daniel Chandler, which you can easily find by doing a Google search. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Hope you feel a little bit clearer about genre theory. Bye for now.